Hi guys, um, <clears throat> very good afternoon to you. Just let me make sure you can hear me. Um, okay, so we're gonna just make a start. Uh, let me know if you can hear me, okay? Um, who have we got? Everybody here. Um, hi Sam. Okay, um, I'm just going to go through the list, uh, see who we have. Uh, so it's Nick, Brett, Georgie, Amy, Hayden, Charlie, Alex, Declan, Harry, Sam, Luke. Uh, hi there. If you are um, not on the list, um, just say hi quickly. I need this for the register, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's make a start on this. So we've got a uh, lot of measurement equipment. I had a look through the um, 315 stuff. Um, I did this um, uh, this presentation, got this ready today, and we've got one more presentation, um, one or two presentations. I have to see how far we get through or how big they, they're going to be. And we've covered all the criteria points uh, for two. Okay, and then the plan is to uh, to have one, maybe two or three presentations where we cover everything from um all the criteria one points just one more time just a summary uh, i know we've covered a lot of it in 308 uh we have made a start on 315 and so it's just going to be um, um what's the term summative um, presentation just a summary where just in brief you're going to cover all the points and everything you need to know uh, which is most important for the for the assignment as well uh so you should you should be well well equipped to you know just based on the presentations uh, for the assignments Okay, I'm going to upload the presentation um, in. Uh, um, I'm going to upload the presentation in um, the same location uh, where, where you've had a look before. So just look for the number uh, three one five, and then uh, everything I do, I, I just dump it in there, and then uh, you can look at it at a later stage and go through those presentations at your own leisure as well. And obviously, this presentation is going to stay on YouTube, so you can go go through it again. So today we're going to look at two aspects. Uh, one of them is Lotto. Uh, we've covered Lotto as part of 308. Uh, we're going to do it one more time. Um, just, just basically, you know, what is the equipment? What have we got for Lotto? Um, why do we need to do this? Why is it important? Yeah, so that's uh, the thing. And then we're just going to look at, uh, we'll be looking at measuring equipment or measurement equipment. Yeah, so it's just meters, all about meters. Um, the next session we're going to be um, zooming in and we're going to sort of zoom in how we are going uh, to measure stuff. Yeah? So how are, we, how are we going to measure it and which way are we going to do it? Okay, so let's go through it. Uh, right, um, so these are the criteria points. Yeah, describe procedures that apply to electrical testing activities. Uh, safety precautions to be taken when carrying out formal inspection and testing of electrical equipment and assess the suitability of different types of test equipment for different types of tests. Yeah. So that's will be one of the outcomes uh, we've got here. Why doesn't it work? Because I'm on the wrong keyboard. Um, right, it's the other keyboard. And it works now. So we've got log off and tag off. Uh, why? And uh, the answer is protect yourself and others from electric shock. So that's uh, uh, a biggie. Uh, the nightmares, and I've seen this in the past because when, when I was working in, in industry, sort of in the steelworks around in the Sheffield area, we didn't have a system like lock off, tag off. Yeah. Um, what we were told is you just went to the fuse board if you worked on some equipment and you took the fuse out and you put it in your pocket. And that was the way to do it. Yeah. And then uh, you try to make sure that wherever you are locally, uh, wherever you're working, that you're isolated from there as well, just in case somebody switches it on. But, um, but it's really, really bizarre. I mean, I'm going back to the 80s. So in the 80s, the, the systems were very laissez-faire. The problem is that, um, you know, somebody, you work on a line, somebody thinks, why is the line not working? Why is it being stopped and, and what's going on here? And, um, and they might just go to the fuse box and especially if it's just a trip fuse, um, they think, oh, you know, it's tripped and they just flick the, the, the trip switch and the line is back working again whilst you're working on the equipment and you might uh, suffer an electric shock. So there has to be obviously um, a lock off where you lock off the um, the the circuit protector, the circuit device, or the breaker, and um, and then the other one is there should be ideally some information. That's where the tack off comes in, 
uh, to inform your colleagues about the outage. And you can do this on your the little thing, you know, do not turn on because, you know, XYZ is working on on that motor or that machine or whatever. Um, and then people know what's going on. And the problem is some lines, as you know, at Hovis or uh, possibly Coca-Cola, you've got lines which are which are uh, pretty long, yeah. So, I mean, the longest line I've seen, um, I'm just trying to think, sort of remember. I once went at um, news printers in, it wasn't just one line, it was several lines, but it, it gives you an idea of how big buildings can be. Uh, news printers in um, near Potter's Bar, just north of the M25. And, um, just trying to think what the town was called. Uh, Potter's Bar was sort of close by. I sort of remember that. Anyway, we were delivering, we were work, doing some work there for, um, for how long was I there? Probably about three weeks. About three weeks. I was there for about three weeks. And, um, and um, um, what happened was, was like this, this Hitchcock thing where you went into a corridor and it just went on forever and ever. Yeah. So it was probably about half a mile long or something, a massive building. I've never seen anything like it. And then some of the machines were the size of terraced houses, so printing presses. And, um, and and they were really big, you know. If you were doing some work on the back of the machine, anybody who was at the front of the machine, um, they, uh, they, uh, they wouldn't know what was going on. Uh, and so you had to have systems uh, to make sure that the machine was not turned on, thinking everything is okay. And, you know, the guy at the front of the machine has done his job and the, uh, the, the bloke at the back, you know, is totally unaware of it. And, and the front man is unaware of the, you know, the guy at the back. So you've got this problem there. And so uh, log off, tack off is important. Yeah? And you need to be able to, to write about this as well when it comes to the assignment. Okay, I think you're all aware of that, why it is important, why um, we have to do it and... and the risks which are involved if you don't, if you're not doing it, you know, what can go wrong. And uh, so it's important. Um, you've seen this at the, um, where's the mouse? Let me just show the mouse. If you look at the mouse, the red kit, I think is the one we've got at the uh, the PMC. So it looks very familiar when you look at all the uh, the lock of items. And then you've got the, the tag off here as well and the, the locks. Uh, it's just another uh, log out. Um, lockout, tagout kit. Um, again, it's um, it's just very important. We have to use it. It's no health and safety requirement, and it makes sense as well. I mean, things can happen quite easily because people uh, may not necessarily be aware of what's what's going on in a production line when they when they're doing a job. Right. Um, next one. Um, can all be te can all tests be done on dead equipment? This is a big question. And, and ideally, yes, you know, if you can turn off the equipment and you do some tests and you take some measurements, um, it, it, it's good, you know, it, uh, you should do it and you should do um, things like insulation tests, resistance tests and earth loop tests. That would have to be done on dead equipment and the equipment for that would have to be dead. Uh, but the problem we have is sometimes you have to work on live equipment and you have to do tests on live equipment. So, for example, if you want to know whether power is going to a motor, yeah. So you've got about, I don't know, um, you've got a three-phase motor, you might have about, um, an average, I'm just talking out of the top of my mind, maybe half a dozen or a dozen points where one of the lives or one of the lines could, uh, could go down. And so if you need to trace a fault, you have to power up the lines to do the fault tracing. Um, can you do it on deadlines? Possibly yes, but it's, it's very difficult. It takes a long time. So in some instances, you um, you have to work on live equipment to do fault testing and fault finding and diagnostics before you can then replace the equipment. And um, and and so it is important to just bear this in mind. It's not you know the easy way out. You know, just isolate the circuit and do whatever you need to do. But sometimes you you can't do this, and you have to be aware of that as well. Uh, stuff like current consumption has to be done on live equipment, power to the equipment, like I said, like if a life is out or something, you, uh, um, it's very, very difficult. You can do it, but it's very difficult to, to do it on dead equipment. Um, and then temperature tests as well. So if you use um, thermography to find out where uh, a motor is running hot and why it is running, running hot. So you may have to uh, do tests on, on live equipment. Yeah? And I'm sure... 
you know, you're working in the industry, you will have been in the position that you've done that. And you can do it in a safe manner as well. So it's not, um, you know, you're not uh, five minutes away from the from the graveyard, but um, you can you can do it in a safe manner. You just need to be aware of what you're doing and uh, make sure you keep safe yourself, you know, following all the rules. We're going to be looking at some test equipment and we've got some common test equipment here. Uh, we're going to look a little bit into sort of the historical side as well. So common equipment, uh, which you find today, is the uh, DMM, which stands for Digital Multimeter. And you'll have uh, seen it at the PMC. We've worked with uh, DMMs quite a lot. Uh, we've also got an AMM, which is an analog multimeter. And you can see some of them here. So you've got a specimen here, which is uh, the so-called AVO. Um, heavy piece of equipment. Uh, how big is it? Um, it's quite big as well. Um, just trying to think about the size of a laptop and about the the weight of about maybe three, four laptops on top of one another. It's quite heavy, quite big, quite sturdy. Um, this equipment was built in 1923 and the latest model which was released of this type of equipment was in two, 2008. So some people really love AVOs. That's their choice of especially older engineers. Um, that's a choice of uh, equipment. Uh, you can see this as well. That's a cheaper ver version of an analog meter. Um, are we okay? It's just coming up. Okay, it's a cheaper version version of an analog meter, and um, it. Um, uh, I think from China, I once bought one for a pound. Uh, uh, the uh, the more expensive ones, which will last a bit longer as well and are reasonably precise, they are about maybe twenty thirty. 40 pounds. Yeah. Uh, we've got the digital multimeters here, so DMM, and um, again, you can get them starting point is about five pounds all the way up to uh, hundreds, if not uh, thousands of pounds for high preci pre precision stuff. Um, okay, we've got voltage testers as well and temperature gauges and so on. We're going to look at them. We're going to look at them in this presentation of what is out there and what we are likely to come across. So back to the AVO meter, uh, you can see the 1923 version, which is down here. Uh, and um, this is a modern version. This is probably the 2008 one, the latest version the, uh, the company produced. AVO meter used to be a company uh, by the name of AVO meter. And that has been, the company has been bought up by Mega. And Mega testing is um, in here in Britain is an acronym for insulation testing. And... Um, um, so insulation testing is like you've seen what we were doing in class when, uh, when I've got my, my meter and doing insulation test using 500 or 1000 volts. A mega built a meter uh, that was capable of doing that. So, uh, so that's where the term mega testing comes from. It's actually just a brand name. It's a bit like Hoover or I'm doing some hoovering, which is just a brand name. Um, but hoovering as a verb doesn't exist. It's just a, just a company, meaning you use your vacuum cleaner or your vacuum clean. Okay, um, so we've got 1923 to 2008. That's when uh, these meters were built. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether they're still built, but the last latest model is from 2008. These meters are very accurate. And the way they work is they've got this, um, this is a full-scale deflection meter. You push a current through this, uh, it's a, a coil meter through the coil. And then the, um, the little indicator, the little needle is gonna wander across the screen depending on the current. You pretty much regulate the current flow to the uh, moving coil meter uh, with a bunch of resistors, and that's what those switches do. And you've got like high precision um, resistors, high power resistors, um, which you select with these two buttons, and you can select uh, or you can test for voltages or for uh, um, uh, for current going through, uh, you know, a device or for resistances as well. Yeah. So all this stuff can be done with this meter. Um, they're very accurate and as I said like they've got a name for themselves so people who learned the trade in the 60s and 70s they would swear by these meters um, I just came across them I mean I'm a different generation I was doing my training in the in the 80s early 80s and um, um, digital meters just came out and they were supposed to be the bee's knees at the time so I grew up with uh, DMMs and I only used analog meters for um, for just special purposes in, in fault finding. 
uh, but but not generally. So when I went out on site and did some took some measurements or something, I always had a digital meter, never had an, an analog meter. But I've met some some guys, some old engineers, probably about 10, 20 years older than me, um, and and they would always use these meters. They wouldn't they wouldn't touch a digital meter with a barge pole. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting when you see that, and they're really it's almost like a religion. They're really um, uh, convinced by these meters. I don't know whether you've ever seen them, and I'll just pose a question to the forum, which allows me to have a sip of tea. Have you ever seen an Avo? Right, I'll have some tea and wait for your responses. Yes, no. Get the other keyboard and type in the question in the chat room. <laughs> Thanks for the answer there, Georgie. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, nope, never. Brett, okay. Um, yeah, it's probably right. It's maybe my, my, the generation above me, my father's generation, they would have worked with an Avo, yeah, pre predominantly. Never seen one, okay. Megaphone selection testing, yeah. I mean, they are a brand name. Um, probably a digital meter as well, Hayden, I would imagine. Um, better than, obviously, the um, meters I use from eBay uh, on the cheap. <laughs> Fluke, yeah, good, um, good brand. Uh, quality as well, high quality, you notice. Uh, in Germany, we had a, a company called Mitex, and, um, and they were quite expensive. So uh, an, a normal DMM was about, uh, I don't know, 20 quid or something. A Mitex meter was about a point. Um, I was measuring a voltage. I didn't realize how, um, you know, what voltage they were using. But I tried to, to find something out, and it was an excess of a couple of thousand volts. And uh, the meter just uh, went blip. And was gone and that was a hundred quid um, and this is a long time ago so it's probably twice as much today down the drain i uh, use it in the gym for yeah, yeah okay ryan yeah i can i can believe that they are really really heavy um surprisingly heavy and you think there's no need for that but it's just the way they are built and um so they are, are quite good meters I'm not sure. I think we've got some at um, at the college. Um, if we have, um, I'll bring it in one day when, when you are back on site and we can do some testing with an, with an Avo as well. We've got some analog meters and I'm going to go, you know, why analog meters are still um, relevant today uh, for certain jobs. And uh, and when I, when I used to be in industry, uh, I always had a good DMM with a spare battery and a spare fuse because uh, um, I was in the habit of leaving them on and uh, then a day later the battery was empty, was drained. Good workman never blames his tools, that's some. I just use my bare hands to, to measure voltage, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Uh, uh, um, anyway, <clears throat> the... Um, um, what was I saying? I lost my train of thoughts there. Um, uh, multimeters, AVO, DMMs. Um, right, I, I always used to have um, a spare battery and a spare fuse. So a DMM would, um, if you leave it on, it takes about a day and then um, the battery is empty and there's nothing worse. You go to a job and your, your meter doesn't work. And um, and so I always had some, some there. same with solder as well. I always had like... Uh, a spare batch of solder in my in my toolbox just in case I forgot to replace the uh, the big reel I would always have some some spare solder to to fix stuff um, 
and and the other thing I always said was a was an analog meter, and there were certain jobs where you really needed an analog meter, and a, a multimeter just or DMM just wouldn't do. And I'm gonna gonna come to talk about this in a moment. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, what about analog test instruments? Uh, disadvantages. So the scales are quite complex. And if you look at the scale of, a, of an analog meter, you always have to interpret. Yeah, so you get like a, a 10 scale and a 25 scale or 250 scale. And then you have to look at the range. So if you've got the 10 scale and the range measures from, uh, you know, one to, from zero to 100 volts, uh, then if the scale goes to five, it means it's 50 volts. So you always have to compensate for that. And it's, uh, it's a little bit of, an, of a nightmare. Um, and it's human error is very easy to uh, to get into it you know, when you when you use an analog meter. With a digi digital meter, it's not that difficult, especially if it's an auto range one. You just stick it on, and it gives you a reading. It sometimes takes a little bit of time you know, for the meter to um, uh, to settle down on a value, and an analog meter is pretty much instant instantaneously. Uh, modern digital meters, good ones like the Fluke range. They are pretty fast as well. So when you when you use them, they uh, come up with a range very very quickly and give you a result within uh, less than a second. And uh, and that's good. The cheap ones sometimes they take like two three seconds, and it can be a little bit unnerving. Okay, they require readings to be interpreted. We said this. They have a relatively low internal resistance, and changing a circuit as uh, measurements are taken. Um, okay, so this is a problem. Yeah. The typical resistance when you take a voltage measurement uh, of um, uh, the internal resistance of um, of a meter is in in the order of maybe 100 kilo ohms or something like that, and and that means when you've got like a, a circuit or you measure a voltage across a very high resistance, which might be also 100 k, and then you put your meter across it to take a reading, so suddenly you put like another 100 kilo ohms in. In parallel, which means the uh, total resistance of that one resistor you're just measuring or you're trying to get a voltage reading from across it uh, goes down by uh, by about half its value, and that means the voltage reading is going to be out by about 50%. So you've got a bit of a problem with uh, analog meters due to the low internal resistance, and so as soon as you put them into a living circuit, a circuit that's powered up, it changes the uh, the circuit. And you get different readings. You don't get necessarily precise readings. Um, the wrong setting can destroy a meter. So if you, for example, put the meter to 10 volts and you are measuring a 240 volt supply, um, it tends to burn out a resistor inside the meter because there's too much current going through. And the display can go and the resistors can go as well. So uh, I've, I've done this as well in my time. So you can destroy them very, very easily. And then the next one is you have to observe polarity. So if you get the polarity wrong, um, it um, goes the other way. The needle tries to go the other way, and you can potentially destroy the, the meter. Uh, all big disadvantages, um, and you have to be very careful when you use them. Um, if you've got time and you're interested, I can tell you a story of somebody who killed himself using one of these meters, and it just makes it uh, brings it to life, you know, what, what you're dealing with uh, when you are taking measurements. Um, actually, that story fits in tomorrow when we look at current measurements. That's what the guy was, uh, he wanted to take a voltage measurement, but his meter was set to current, and the leads were plugged into current measurement, and uh, it killed him. Uh, advantage, you get an instant reading, there's no sampling um, uh, required with a meter. So a digital meter has got a sampling, uh, it needs some time for that. In the olden days, it took like a few seconds, in modern days it's pretty fast, and they're almost instantaneous, so they've come a long way. Um, but with an analog meter, it's, it's de facto instant. Yeah. Um, and this is a biggie. Yeah. And this is the reason why I always set a, an analog meter with me in my toolbox uh, when I was in industry. And it'll pick up on intermittent faults. Um, and digital meters, especially when you just get a bunch of numbers in front of you, and, um, and uh, there's like a fault. I mean, it's not every fault, but some faults where something, for example, the voltage goes down Every now and then you get like a little bit of a blip. Uh, a digital meter may not pick it up because it looks for an average reading. The analog meter, you can actually see the needle just going down a bit and then coming back up again. Yeah. So if you're looking for intermittent faults, um, uh, 
analog meters are, are far better. You know, they give you, um, because it's instant and it's direct connection with the circuit, there's no uh, fancy interface in between them. <clears throat> very, very simple uh, connection between the circuit and the needle when you look at how a meter is built up. And, um, and uh, because of that, you can see intermittent faults very, very quickly. You can pick up on that a lot better than using a digital meter. And that's pretty much the only reason why, uh, not the only, but, but the main reason why I had a, uh, an analog meter in my, in my toolbox. I still make sure I've got plenty of analog meters around. I think I've got about three or four. Uh, I'm just trying to look. I'm looking at my workshop here. Uh, I've got a couple of them in there. And then, yeah, so three, four analog ones, which are sort of uh, still in use and, and I'm keeping around. And every now and then I still, still need them as well. Um, the next one, which is quite important as well, when you take a digital meter and you all you need to do and try it out, you just um, keep the leads, spread them out and a bit like an antenna and then go to uh, the millivolt reading and you start getting readings. Yeah. And um, the same as well when you've got some static, you, you just need to put the leads near where the static is and you get a reading for that as well. Um, and... And that's to do with the very high internal resistance a digital meter has. Um, so that uh, none of the signal is gobbled up, but, but sometimes it gives you wrong readings. Now with a, an analog meter, you don't get this. Uh, because again, it's, it's a, an advantage of the relatively low resistance. If you take a voltage reading or something, you don't get like freaky uh, values, especially sort of in the millivolt range, uh, which suddenly appears seemingly out of nowhere. And uh, so again, advantages disadvantages and that's the reason why it might maybe a good good idea to keep one around just in case you ever you ever need one and familiarize yourself with them as well to to take readings and see how they work okay next one is a dmm and that's probably the one you'll all be familiar with and you'll be working with um it's got a high input resistance um years ago it used to be about about two mega ohms two million ohms uh nowadays it's a bit higher uh, so four or five maybe even higher. Um, the problem is if the internal resistance is too high, it picks up on a lot of, um, you know, crap, which you don't really want to, to read or you're not interested in, like static and things like that. Uh, the beauty is they've got a very low impact on uh, a circuit tested. And, um, and so when you work on live circuits, you can actually take precise readings and the meter itself doesn't falsify the reading, so it doesn't have any impact or very little impact on them. And that is sort of a great, a great bonus, especially when you, when you sort of fault find in a, in a live circuit. Um, there's less chance to misinterpret data. So you, you get a reading, uh, you can see this here, and you just get a number and it tells you the units in the end, at the end of it, whether it's milli, micro, nano, or like the full volts or amperes or whatever you're measuring. And so whatever the numbers, it's a number. So you don't have to multiply or subtract or, or look for the right scale or anything like that. So the chances of human error by just misinterpreting whatever you're reading are uh, a lot less. Um, the um, technology is cheap. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure how many multimeters I've got. I... Um, I always get tempted when I go to a gadget shop and I see some cheap meters. I think, yeah, you can't have enough of them. So I keep one in the car. I've got one in my, my workshop. Um, I've got a couple of meters which um, I don't trust anymore. They come up sometimes with weird readings on some ranges, but the other ranges are still okay. No idea. I think I've got maybe about um, half a dozen, maybe a dozen sort of floating about uh, my sphere of life. Um, but you can pick them up for about five quid and you get some really decent good ones. If you spend about a hundred pounds, you get a really good decent meter with a lot of uh, functionality. And, um, and um, um, so little money can buy you an awful lot of uh, measuring equipment. Uh, I would suggest to you as well, if you haven't got one yourself, you know, doing this course and doing the apprenticeship just to, you know, uh, spend a little bit. Spend 10 quid, 20 quid, or uh, I got a really good one once for 30 quid. It was supposed to have a, a USB connection to it, so you could pick up the data. But uh, when I opened the meter up to have a look inside, the USB board was there, but it wasn't connected to anything. So uh, it was, uh, I don't know, uh, was a bit of a problem there. But um, but the rest was really good. And um, 
I think I've had it at work. I'm using it at work quite frequently, and it works fine. Yeah, works fine, and it got a huge amount of um, uh, functionality. Uh, you can have a wide range of measurements, so it starts off with uh, like microvolts all the way to uh, to kilovolts for for some of those meters, ohms as well, going from very low to very high. Um, it's de facto standard today. It's a very safe equipment, uh, less likely to be destroyed through, through error. So if you reverse polarity, um, nothing happens. You just get a minus sign if you. Um, uh, get the put the wrong range in. You know, you're measuring like 200 volts, and you put the 20 volt range in. Um, uh, all it'll do it'll just come up with um, um, with an uh, overflow message uh, um, and uh, overload message, and then you just uh, you know change the range, and, and everything is fine. You can use the auto range ones um, where you don't have to bother about anything, and and the biggie is they're almost impossible to destroy. Uh, um, but I managed to destroy quite a few of them, other than, you know, dropping it or driving over it. But through measurements, it's very, very difficult to destroy them these days. Okay, specialist testing equipment. So we're going to look at um, specialist equipment as well. Uh, we've got the low resistance ohm meter. We have um, the insulation resistance tester. We've got the uh, voltage indicator. Um, we've got earth fault loop impedance tester phase testing meter and fault current tester. Yeah, so these are the uh, bits of equipment we're going to look at. Uh, some of it, I mean, I think before, you know, the equipment we looked at before, the DMM and the AMM, you probably have seen them before and you, you will have certainly worked with them before. Um, and here we are going into a different range. Yeah. Okay. Move on. So first of all, the low resistance ohm meter. Okay. And it's a sp specialist equipment. And uh, you want to test them typically for coils, for windings and motor windings, um, but also when you've got an earth line, you want to know how low is the resistance really. You know? So one ohm on an earth wire, uh, when you've got huge currents you're dealing with, 10 amps or whatever, can cause huge problems. You can have massive, massive voltages developing across the wire in fault conditions, which you want to avoid. And so sometimes it's very important to make sure that your resistance stays below um, a certain value so that you are within the milliohm range rather than the ohm range. Yeah, so one or two ohms. Um, right, so you've got a couple of meters down here. Um, there's one here and you can see it's, you know, the, the resistances you are measuring, they're typically below two ohms. Yeah. Um, I've got one here as well, and you've seen this meter as well. That's the one. Uh, uh, that's my little meter, my insulation tester, um, courtesy of the Far East, um, for not much money. Um, and uh, again, it's got got a range on there for for low resistance testing as well. So uh, you can uh, measure, for example, coil windings. Yeah. And, and again, this might be important if you've got a three-phase motor, a typical coil winding will test to about two, three ohms, maybe a uh, uh, bit more, a bit less. But once you've got the, um, so for example, if you've got three windings for a three-phase motor, which pretty much should have the same resistance, and one of them is out, uh, you know that there may be a problem, or one of them is high. So instead of uh, you know 2.5 ohms, you've suddenly got about eight or nine ohms. Uh, you know you've got some problems with the, the winding and the motor might be on the way out. Yeah. And so sometimes it's important to be able to measure uh, very low resistances. Okay. The insulation resistance meter. So I'm sure I've done the insulation test with, with you. And again, it's the same meter you can see there. Uh, follow the mouse. Uh, also, you know, watch out whenever you do an insulation test, you're using very high voltages and you're using different terminals on your on your meter as uh, doing the the low voltage tests yeah so for example for a uh, uh, low voltage resistance test yeah or, um, or or just a voltage test you know measuring a voltage so again this is um, you use different terminals for that yeah so uh, the, the the first point again to about an insulation resistance meter is that insulation is voltage dependent yeah Every meter, when, when you test resistance, will, uh, will put out a small voltage 
uh, normally, you know, for a meter might be uh, one volt or sometimes it's nine volt. Uh, sometimes it's, it's even less than a volt because you don't want to have any impact on the circuit. And, um, and, um, and, that's, and that's a problem. Yeah? So if you want to test insulation, um, insulation is dependent on voltage. Yeah? So uh, the way an insulator normally works is you, um, you, you whack up the voltage, you go up and up and up and up, and everything is fine until it hits a certain point, until it hits a certain voltage. And then it breaks down and, and it almost behaves like a conductor. So the resistance goes right on from several million ohms to, to virtually no ohms. Yeah. So this is the way an insulator works. And so if you want to make sure that the insulation is up to scratch, uh, you need to use voltages which are in excess, in excess of the operating voltage for whatever equipment you're, you're, you're dealing with. So again, if you've got three-phase system, the operating voltage is 415 volts. So then you have to multiply it by uh, 1.41 to get the peak voltage. So that's just RMS. So the peak voltages are going to be about 600 volts. Um, so you have to use about a thousand volt insulation test to make sure that the insulators are up to scratch. So the 500 volt insulation test is not good enough because your peaks will go over and beyond um, uh, 500 volts. For a 240 volt system, the peak voltage, so 230 volts times uh, 1.41 is 339 volts. So it's about 340 volts. Near enough, that's a peak value. Uh, again, all you need to do there is an insulation test uh, based on 500 volts. So if the insulator can withstand uh, 500 volts, um, you're okay. Yeah. Right. Therefore, insulation needs to be tested over the voltage. Okay, we did this when dealing with AC capacitance and of voltage. Okay, that's another thing as well. Just sort of put this in the back of your mind. Uh, when we are dealing with circuits uh, that have got inductances and um, uh, or capacitances, you can sometimes find voltages well, well in excess of the operating voltage. And again, when you look at a motor, a motor is just one big inductor. There are inductances all over the place. Yeah? Inductance means it's just a coil. And... Um, and again, when you turn it off and uh, the, the magnetic field around the coil breaks down and it's got nowhere to go, or there's a big resistance somewhere uh, across the switch where you've turned it off, you can uh, get voltages which are five, six, seven times higher than the, um, than the operating voltage. So that means if your motor runs on 240 volts and you just switch it off and it hits a peak on the waveform, uh, you could be looking at about uh, three, four, five thousand volts. Uh, for a very short moment in time. So it's just a couple of uh, milliseconds or not even any milliseconds, possibly nanoseconds um, or microseconds, right about there. But for a very short period of time, but it could, could cause a lot of problems. And that's something to bear in mind. Uh, again, when you've got an insulator, you have to make sure that ideally that uh, whatever potential voltage you're likely to come across is, is dealt with. Okay, Callum, and we're going to talk about this later as well. I'm just looking at the chat room. Callum says we used to blow fuses in them all the time at college for having them on the wrong settings when measuring things. Yeah, yeah that, that's when we look at uh, ammeters. Uh, we're just looking at DMMs. Um, when, you measure in, when you measure voltages and you've got your meter, the, 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 the terminals connected or the wires connected to the correct terminals, uh, which would be common and V for voltage, um, everything is fine, but as soon as you go to common and then A for ampere, it's, it's almost like a straight piece of wire. If you put it across a power supply, you'll blow the fuse straight away. So uh, we're going to talk about this tomorrow in a bit more detail. Okay, um, I'll have a little bit of a pause. I've been talking an awful lot. Any questions so far? Are you okay with this? Does it make sense? Get the other keyboard and talk in the room.
Okay, I'm just going to wait for a moment to see whether there are any questions coming through. Uh, you can say yes if you're okay with this. <laughs> the main thing about insulation testers is, is the whole thing about voltage. You know, high voltage, eventually insulators will break down. Uh, and you just need to make sure that they don't break down at the um, voltage you apply. When you look at three-phase motors, for example, um, all you have on the coils is a, bit, is a little bit of lacquer. They put some lacquer, some enamel on, on the, the wire they use for the coils, and then they wind them together. And that's all done in an industrial process. And if there's a problem with the lacquer, uh, the enamel type of stuff that's on, on the wires, um, the insul insulators can break down quite easily. So that's one problem. Thanks, Amy, uh, for the feedback. Any, anybody else still listening? <laughs> um, okay, I just have a sip of tea and um, carry on. Feel free to, um, you know, text in at any time during my talk. Okay, move on. Voltage indicators. Um, <clears throat> they are sort of, you can see this here, what they look like. They're just sort of simple bits of equipment. Um, at, right, Ryan Kreese, yeah. Okay, I'm just looking at the, the text, uh, Haydn, Georgie, Ryan, Declan. Uh, thanks for that. Th thanks for the feedback. Yeah. Okay, um, voltage indicators. I, personally, I'm, I'm not that keen on them because I want to, if I put my meter in somewhere, I, just, I don't just want to have an LED to tell me, yes, it's 240 volts, so it's not 240 volts. I want to know exactly what's going on. That's sort of just a personal thing. So I would always prefer to use a DMM to, to take my measurements. Um, <clears throat> but there are voltage testers, and so you can test uh, a face against uh, neutral or earth and uh, get a reading. And next to it, you've got something which is called a proving unit, which is very important. So the whole idea is when you want to test that a circuit is dead, so for example, you've done your lock off and tug off, so uh, you go back to the motor you're about to change, <clears throat> you look at the terminals and you use this, this probe to see whether it's dead. So this probe is not going to come up with anything. All LEDs are dead, but you don't know whether the probe's broken down. So you've got this proving unit on the side of here. So you put your meter in the proving unit. Uh, the light should come up. The proving unit will supply 240 volts. So everything should come up. And so you can verify that your equipment was working when you did the test. And you can do this with the proving unit. And um, so the... The beauty about these things is that they are um, very simple, simple piece of equipment. It avoids human error, so you don't have to select anything. So you don't have to, you know, go through the, the ranges and you can't accidentally select the, uh, the wrong setting. <coughs> it's all sort of produced and designed with safety in mind, especially with the proving unit. And um, <clears throat> they're just very, very simple to use, very simple to use. And so these are just the typical voltage indicators just to... <clears throat> to verify whether something is live or, or dead. Yeah, it's a very simple equipment. The next one is, is a earth fault loop in test, impedance test. Okay, let, let me try this again. Earth fault loop impedance test. So what is, what is this all, uh, all about? Now, impedance is a mixture of reactant and um, resistance. Yeah? So when you've got a line, like an earth line, uh, you've always got like a little bit of uh, resistance and we are going into the milliohm range. So it's a tiny, mini bit of resistance. The longer the wire, the higher the resistance. And then there's an aspect which is called impedance. So if you've got, um, you're dealing with 50 hertz and um, with the impedance, you look at reactances which are in the system. Then there's something like capacitive reactance, which is going to be very low for 50 hertz. Um, but if you've got a, you know, some wire coiled up or something, you will also have a, an inductive reactance. A reactance means that uh, the resistance, the apparent resistance of the of the component, the wire, or whatever you're, you're dealing with, is changing with frequency. 
Yeah, so um, the, the DC resistance tells you, yeah, this is um, uh, 10 milliohms, but then you uh, put some AC value or you put an AC current through it and you find that the resistance is actually more like um, 50 milliohms yeah? because you've got some curled up stuff somewhere and you get some inductance, possibly some capacitance as well, and, um, and that changes the value. Okay, um, we're going to look at reactants in a little bit. I think it's tomorrow where we're going to look at reactants. Is it tomorrow? I think so, yeah. When we look at different types of equipment and how the equipment works and how we need to, to use it. Um, so we've got um, a formula here, and you can see this down here. So we've got the um, ZE, which is the ex external fault loop impedance. Impedance is measured in ohms, but the, the, uh, the symbol for that is Z. Uh, then we've got a resistance, uh, which is the uh, phase conductor resistance, earth conductor resistance. You can see this here. Uh, and, um, and that's just DC box standard resistance, as, as we've dealt with now. And, um, <clears throat> and then we've got the total impedance, which is um, the um, um, external forward loop impedance plus all the resistances taken, taken together. And that gives us the impedance. You don't need to worry about this too much, so you don't have to, to use this for the assignment or uh, there's no exam on that or anything, so you don't have to um, choke up when you see all the formulas and letters and, and stuff like that. So don't worry too much about it. It's just um, sort of explaining what's going on here and what we are looking for. So basically what we want to know is um, if we've got a short, a short circuit and our live wire is connected straight down to Earth, which is sort of the protective bit of it, um, what's going to happen? You know, what is the current going through uh, the earth wire, and is is it going to be enough to trigger the fuse? You know, to to let the overload kick in, and um, and that's really what we are after, what we what we are trying to find out, and what we need to calculate. So <clears throat> we need to make sure that the earth wire has got a low enough resistance um, that uh, that the overload is going to be triggered. Which I mean, for small circuits and and you know the domestic stuff you're likely to deal with is not that much of a problem, um, but when you've got a, a machine that pulls in, um, um, I don't know, 100 amps at um, at 240 volts or at 415 volts, uh, a massive motor, um, then obviously the earth wire needs to be a lot a lot stronger to carry 100 amps and more uh, sufficiently to um, to to let the overload kick in and to let the protective circuits uh, do their job if anything goes wrong. Again, this is just another um, scenario here. So you've got your meters and the meters are um, taking measurements. Yeah? So you're trying to take measurements, ambition and installation, just to make sure that everything is okay. Um, three, one, five, or oh, fail as well. Right, some equipment, earth loop equipment, and you can see this here as well. Um, when you look at the values which come up here, so we've got 49.6, and you see the little sign here, that's micro, micro ohms. Yeah. So you're looking at really tiny values of resistance, uh, which you're trying to, um, to determine. Uh, again, here we've got, and you can see all the terminals and uh, the readings you get. Okay, um, right, any questions so far? Are you okay with this so far? You're not too scared or too frightened with the, uh, uh, you don't have to do any math or anything for the assignment, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, moving on. Uh, what is the main issue for Ford earth loop testing? Big currents generate big voltage drops across big resistances. Yeah? So that's the whole thing. So we, we are back on this one here. When you look at, just follow the mouse, when you look at uh, Ohm's law and the magic triangle, we've got V is equal to I times R. So if I goes up, V goes up. If R goes up, V goes up as well. So even if we are talking about milliohms and really tiny resistances, so just imagine you've got... Um, <coughs> um, a resistance of 10 ohms, yeah, which doesn't sound an awful lot on your on your earth wire, and you've got um, <clears throat> you've got a current of uh, of one amp, yeah, 
which which goes down the earth wire so <clears throat> if you've got a current of one amp going down the earth wire at uh, what did i say at 10 ohms um you would have um 10 volts straight away which isn't a lot but if you've got a current of 10 amps <clears throat> 10 ohms you'll, you'll be looking at about 100 uh, at 100 volts yeah. so that means for a short moment in time you'd have um before the protective circuit kicks in um you might have a voltage of about 100 100 ohms on the um on the earth wire for just a fairly low resistance yeah and that's that's what you need to avoid and that's why why it's important to make sure it's as low as possible within the uh, specifications and why you have to do these tests uh, so even a low resistance can produce lethal voltages 100 volts can be lethal when there's a big enough current flowing through the conductor yeah. again if you go to 100 um, 100 ampere flowing down the earth wire and you've got um, just one ohm resistance you're looking at about 100 volts yeah. And if you touch that thing, 100 volts can potentially be lethal. You, you certainly feel 100 volts. Uh, that's for sure. I've had my fair share of shocks. So 100 volts is, uh, you, you feel it. Yeah, it makes you dance. Um, the next one is a phase testing meter. So we've got three phases, life one, life two, life three. And um, you want to make sure that all of them are working well. And uh, down here, you've got a very simple meter. So you just um, put it on all three phases, little light will come up and it'll tell you it's working. Same here as well, just a digital form, yeah, digital meter. And then you've got a little bit more sophisticated meter, so you can probably, I'm, I'm not sure how good it is. There are some meters around which show you the waveforms as well, so you can make sure that everything is correct, you know, that the waveform looks okay, that it's a nice sinusoidal waveform and not some choppy uh, rectangular waveform. Um, it'll show you, um, potentially um, voltages as well, any mismatch um, between the phases and, and so on. Phase shifts as well, they, they normally shouldn't change, but you never know. Um, so all this is done by these sophisticated machines. So I think this is maybe uh, a tenner, there's probably a hundred quid, and that's, you're looking at a couple of thousand pounds uh, for this equipment. Okay, so that's the uh, phase testing meter. at 3.30. Okay, no problems. We'll, we'll go through. Uh, we are almost done here with the uh, presentation. So we've got a fault current test meter. Uh, measure current peaks when a fault occurs, ensuring the safety equipment works. Um, again, notice this one here. So this is a clump meter. And then uh, we've got um, typical fault current test meters as well. So they just look for the current and then uh, try and um, see you know what current is going through the system and a fault occurs okay uh, we've got a bunch of tasks here uh, I'm gonna email them to you so that's your job uh, after this and uh, so we've got three tasks and a couple of questions and um, that's it okay so that's your homework to, to go through. We've done everything. We're going to carry on tomorrow morning uh, going through those tasks. And then uh, in the afternoon, we'll, we'll have a look at um, the next presentation. Okay, uh, Charlie, you've got, I, I've seen the message. You've got um, meetings with your mentors. I'll um, close at this point, let you carry on with the mentors. I'll see you tomorrow morning uh, about uh, 10 o'clock, 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30. About 10.30, yeah. So we're just going to go through those questions. So it gives you some time to do those questions. We're going to go through them, and then in the afternoon we'll have uh, the next session on this. And then I think it's probably two summary sessions, and we're done with uh, 3.15. And then it's just uh, getting you ready for the assignment for the write-ups. Any questions? Uh, if you need to leave for your mentor, feel free to do so. Uh, if you get your call at 3.30, it's fine. A uh, bit of bitter? Any questions, anybody?
Okay, uh, let me just go through those questions. I'm just going to run those uh, questions um, bit by bit, or those tasks. And uh, so they are on the, the video, but I will email them to you as well. So you should be able to, to do them from, from, from the email. Okay, that's the first task. Uh, why would engineers being asked to change the three-phase motor on production uh, line? As it is about lunch and everything stops for one hour, he decides to change the motor over lunch. Since time is of the essence to be done uh, within the hour, um, he decides not to do a log off, tug off, and not to bother with a permit to work. What could happen in a worst case scenario? Yeah. Just think about it. So, engineer goes out, uh, a little bit of a maverick, and um, that's what he wants to do. And um, what could be the worst case scenario? Yeah. Task number two, uh, three-phase motor is suspected to be faulty. Determine the equipment you would use to test uh, the three-phase motor and to, to determine a possible fault. Just think about uh, all the equipment, you know, the measuring equipment we've just been introduced in this presentation. Uh, which equipment could you use and what could you do with it to test a three-phase motor? Okay, uh, a circuit on a production line is showing a fault tripping the RCD. What test equipment would you use to be able to diagnose the root of the problem? Uh, okay, um, have a look at that one as well and, you know, give me the reason why. We've got a couple of quick questions as well. Why would you want to use an analog meter over over and above a, a digital meter? What voltage would you choose to, to use for uh, an insulation test on a three-phase system? What is the lowest acceptable voltage for an insulation test on a single-phase system? Name two disadvantages for using analog meters. What could happen if you use a digital meter in an environment with uh, a lot of static electricity? And then uh, the last Quick questions. What happens to a live circuit when you take a measurement uh, with a digital multimeter? Um, you measure an earth resistance of 500 milliohms, a fault occurs, and a current of 100 amperes generated. Uh, what is the voltage dropped across the conductor? Could this voltage considered to be lethal? So just um, see whether you can figure it out. It's not that hard. It's just a little bit of uh, mental arithmetic, and you've got it. Okay. Um, most of you are already gone, which is okay. Um, tomorrow back at 10.30 and we'll uh, go through those questions and then in the afternoon we'll have the next presentation. Okay, I'll uh, see you tomorrow. Any questions, feel free to um, just type them in. And uh, we'll look at the rest tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye.